All right, this is a review video for uh, light, otherwise known as optics unit of Regents Physics. It is a review. I'm going to go pretty quick. Let's do this. Uh, light is also known as electromagnetic waves. In fact, uh, when we usually use the term light, we're talking about visible light, which is a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, which I'm going to get to in a moment. All right, some things that we need to know about EM waves. All EM waves, they do not require a physical medium to travel through. They can travel through a vacuum. This is uh, in contrast to a mechanical wave, which does need a medium. This explains why light and other radiation can travel from the sun to the, throughout the rest of the solar system. Um, rather than it being particles vibrating uh, through a medium, uh, instead, EM waves consist of basically electromagnetic fields that are created from oscillating charges. So we have a charge that moves as it jitters. It creates an EM field that propagates away from it. Ele uh, electromagnetic waves are transverse waves. Remember, those are the ones that look like you know standard waves that you would probably draw, the up and down waves. Electromagnetic waves can vary in wavelength, frequency quite a bit. In fact, your largest waves, like your radio waves, can be sizes of mountains, really, buildings in size. Whereas your your very small wavelength waves, gamma radiation, uh, those can be even smaller than, say, the nucleus of an atom, really, really tiny. Visible light, it's a very small portion of the EM spectrum, pretty much going 400 to 800 nanometers in wavelength with like your 800 side being the deep end of the red spectrum. In fact, that's actually dipping into the infrared. Uh, and your 400 is higher up, more closer towards the violet end of the spectrum. Remember Roy G. Biv, I hope. I'll get to that in a second when I show you the EM chart. And then electromagnetic waves travel. All of them travel at the speed of light. So even though it's a radio wave or a microwave or a gamma, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. They're all EM. Therefore, they all have the speed of light, which we will indicate as C because it's a constant while in a vacuum. 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. If you forget that, it is on the front page of your tables. Let's look at their electromagnetic spectrum. This is inside the reference tables. You see here the spectrum had the top number is wavelength and the bottom number is frequency. They are inversely related to each other. So a wave with a very high frequency has a very small wavelength. And the flip side, a wave with a low frequency has a very large wavelength. So gamma rays, for example, they're they're really tiny, 10 to the negative 13 in size, very high frequency. We go to the right side of the spectrum, we're all the way down on our radio waves, which are massive in size. Uh, thousands of meters long or can be, uh, but they can also be relatively small. This is, you know, right around centimeter size wavelengths. And then we've got other parts of the spectrum um, separated. We've got x-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, microwaves, radio, radio waves, uh, long and short. And then you've got your visible light, which is this tiny little band here in the middle. And so what you also, not only should you understand the spectrum a little bit, you should have a general feel for what's where. Um, but I also like to indicate energy. Uh, frequency is what we're going to associate with energy for electromagnetic radiation. So anywhere where we have a high frequency, we're going to have higher energy. And lower frequency is lower energy. So like gamma rays carry a ton of energy and radio waves don't carry a lot of energy at all. I like to think of visible light spectrum as the kind of the middle ground of what is safe or not safe to be exposed to more or less if you're exposed to waves that are higher in energy, higher in frequency than visible light. It's dangerous and anything less than that in frequency is not so dangerous. That's not completely true. Uh, microwave radiation can be very dangerous. Infrared can definitely be dangerous for you. You don't want to be exposed to this for very long bits of time. But more or less on the atom by atom level, uh, your atoms are safe at the infrared level and dangerous at the UV level. This is why we want to wear sunscreen when we go outside. This is why we wear vests when we go to the dentist's office for x-rays. This is why we stay as far away from gamma rays as we possibly can because they are not safe. They can penetrate through multiple layers of material trying to keep you safe. So stay away from gamma rays if you can. Uh, that's more or less EM waves. There's a whole lot more to it. So this is just a review. Let's get to the boundary stuff. We got two types of things that occur at a boundary. Either light will reflect off of the boundary or light will penetrate through 
the boundary. We also have this other one, you know, so that's reflection and transmission. Then we have this other one that's absorption. That tends to happen when things like heat up, they retain that energy. Uh, we just need to understand that concept. The uh, reflection and transmission part, which we're going to call refraction, there's more to it than just the concept. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little boundary here. I'm not going to tell you what's below the boundary. For now, we're just going to say there's a boundary. And I'm going to say I have a light ray approaching that boundary. As that light ray approaches that boundary, it's going to fall incident on the boundary. The term incident always means the incoming ray. Then we'll either refer to one of two things, the reflected ray or the refracted ray. Let's first talk about reflected. Anytime you have a ray incident on a boundary, your first task, especially in Regents level, when you're going to do this on an exam, is to create a normal line, which remember is a line that's perpendicular to the surface at that spot. Use a straight edge. Don't go cheap like I did. Understand that your incident ray is always drawn in reference to the normal line. It is not in reference to the surface. This has to do with the fact that not all surfaces are evenly and flat. They'll bend, they'll move around, and this can be very hard to create a uniform uh, method of determining reflected rays. So we always create the normal line at the moment, at the spot that the ray hits. And then uh, we draw, our, we use our protractor to measure this. So this interior one from the normal line to the ray, that's what we call theta i, which stands for our incident ray or incident angle. The law of reflection, nice and simple, one of the easiest laws in physics, says that it will always reflect away from the normal line equal to the angle of incidence. So the angle of reflection will always be equal to the angle of incidence. Now, I just eyeballed it. Use a protractor on the actual exam. Uh, but this guy here is our theta r, or our reflected ray. And they have to equal each other. So if I knew, let's say, this was, let's say I knew this was 50 degrees, then I know this too is 50 degrees. And it's always in reference to the normal line, not the surface angle. Because again, it could drop off. It could curve away. And it might not be as easy as you think to determine. That's just reflected light. Well, we also have the possibility of there being transmitted light or refracted light. And it turns out that light tends to slow down when it enters a new medium. Or shall I say this? It'll slow down when it enters a new optically dense medium. So we have to kind of talk about this term here, optically dense. When light transmits into a new medium, it could do one of two or three things, really. It can either slow down, speed up, or not change at all. So for example, if we're going from uh, the vacuum of space to our atmosphere, especially the upper atmosphere, light doesn't tend to bend too much. It doesn't slow down a lot because atmosphere doesn't slow light down a whole heck of a lot compared to the emptiness of space. But then when we take that same light that maybe is traveling through the air and let it go into water, that water is more optically dense. It's going to slow the light down. And if that light hit that boundary of that water at some angle, it's going to actually cause that light to bend. That's why we call it refraction. So let me draw that. I'm going to leave the reflected up there because I'll probably come back to that. I'm going to create myself a boundary, and that's going to be water now. So this whole area, I could draw blue if I wanted to get all artsy. I'm just going to say water. And this area up here is my air. I'm just going to use this as a very simple ex explanation. And so light will fall incident on the air. You know, I'm going to use a different color for that. The light will fall incident on the air to water boundary. Once again, you've got to create a normal line at that surface. That's going to be very important. All of the geometry is always in reference to a normal line, which is just a point there to help you. It's not a real location. And we want to know what happens to that light as it goes from air into water. Well, since air is a low optical density and water is higher, that light is going to slow down. Let me show you that. The front page of your reference table is in the bottom corner has your indices of refraction. No, it doesn't. That's your coefficients of, of friction. Your indices of refraction are the ones below the EM spectrum. Here it is. And we'll see here that air has an index of refraction of 1. That's the same as a vacuum. That means it's going the fastest it can possibly go. Anytime it enters a medium higher than 1, it'll slow down. And you look at water, it's got an index of 1.33. It's going to indeed slow down when it enters in this new water. When it slows down, and you should just memorize this at this point if you don't understand why. I could go through and explain why, but it'll just be too time-consuming. Understand these following two rules. I'm going to get down here, and we'll talk about these equations in a minute. When light travels from a medium with high index 
to one with a lower index, it bends away from the normal, meaning the angle gets bigger. It's because it speeds up. When it goes from a low index to a higher index, it bends toward the normal. It's because it slows down, so the angle decreases. Well, air is a lower index than water, so therefore it's going from a low index to a higher index. It is indeed going to bend toward the normal line. So my angle that it uh, now has in reference to the normal will be smaller than my incident angle. So we're going to call this my incident angle still. It's still incident. We're now probably not going to call this theta r, even though we could because it's refracted. Instead, we're going to say theta 2 because there's still a reflected angle. And here's the reason why I left this up here. Anytime you have refraction, you're also going to have some level of reflection. Some light will bounce off that boundary. This is like when you look at a pond and you see your reflection in the pond. That's the reflected light, not your refracted light. So we're still going to have theta r here. Remember, these two angles are equal to each other. But we don't necessarily get refraction when we always have reflection. So think of a mirror. Light often doesn't penetrate the material of the mirror, especially if it's glass. All right, let's get into some equations. Uh, there's an equation known as Snell's Law. It's this great relationship to the geometry in the original medium to the new medium. So Snell's law, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, n1, n being the index of refraction, theta being your original angle, n2 being your new index, and theta 2 being your new angle. So here, n1 is 1, because air is 1, n2 is water, that's 1.33, theta 1 is this theta i, I don't know what, I'm not going to measure it right now. And then theta 2 is, of course, theta 2. Usually, you know three of these, you can solve for the fourth. In fact, most of you have probably done a lab on this. It's a pretty straightforward thing. We also know that light slows down. In fact, that's where the index value comes from. It's basically a ratio of how fast it could go in a vacuum, C, to how fast it's actually going in the medium. So n equals C over V. That means the higher the index, the slower the velocity when the light is traveling through that medium. So if we look at these uh, indices of refraction, you'll see here that light, for example, when going in diamond, is going very slow. When it's going in water, it's actually not slowing down all that much compared to diamond. You'll even see that some of these have the same index value. Let's look at corn oil, for example, and glycerol. If I had a vial that had both corn oil and glycerol in it, and I was measuring the angles of light as it's traveling through those medium, I'll notice no change. It'll just penetrate right through without bending at all because these indices are the same. Let me draw that real quick. So once again, if I just had, oh, my boundary, if I had uh, this being, well, I don't know, we'll say corn oil up top and glycerol down here, as we take that ray and it approaches that boundary, we can still draw a new normal line if we wanted to, but in reality, we don't need to because we know it won't bend. I tried to make it so that it didn't bend. It looked like it turned slightly. There, it looks a little better. It just goes straight through. Does that mean glycerol and corn oil are the same thing? No. It just means they have the same optical density. And then lastly, since we can vary speed or we can determine how speed changes and we also know the original wave speed equation, V equals F lambda, we have to remember that for a given wave, F won't change. So no matter what, the frequency of the light here is the same as the frequency down here. Red will still look red. Uh, we can set this equal. We can say that V1 over lambda 1 must equal F. And since F won't change, it's, we, we, get, we can get ourselves a nice little ratio. And we can combine these to create this equation. I'm not going to go through the derivation. Most of you can probably see it right now. But we're going to get N2 to N1 is B equivalent to V1 to V2, which is equivalent to the ratio of lambda 1, the wavelength in the first medium, to lambda 2. Last bit are just a few conceptual points for uh, optics that you should know. Um, we have some what we'll call, what I'm referring to as refraction phenomena, which are really just things that take place when the uh, uh, light travels through medium. Uh, we have dispersion, which is the rainbow effect. It's like when you see a rainbow when looking through 
um, various raindrops or you'll see it through a prism. Uh, we're going to get white light that separates into the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. This is because the end value for red is actually slightly different than for violet. So when we talk about these end values on this table here, this is on average what the entire visible spectrum experiences when traveling through this medium. But in reality, if I were to show you a dispersion table, you'd see that red has a different index than violet has. And it turns out that red actually has a slightly lower index than violet, so violet will bend a little bit more. So by the time it leaves that medium, they're separated from each other. Prisms just play with the geometry a little bit to really exaggerate that separation. Otherwise, if it was nice and perfect and parallel, the red and violet will unbend the same bend that they got when entering the medium. So we'll go from white light to red violet separated in the medium, but then as soon as it leaves, the medium would be white light, and you wouldn't really notice that rainbow effect dispersion. Check it out. It's pretty cool stuff. And then the last one is the total internal reflection. This is kind of like skipping a rock on a pond. It turns out that when you have a medium originating in a high index, so maybe it starts in water and trying to go to air, has to originate in the higher index. When it's trying to go from high index to a low index, you can get to a point where it just simply won't leave. I'm going to try to illustrate that uh, down here. I'm going to remove my reflection bit right here. And if I were to draw a tube here with uh, light originating in this, so this is water, okay? This is air, water, air. Uh, you might start to get, you know, at a shallow index of uh, incidence, remember that's to the normal line, so a small angle here, you will get some bending of light. But then as we exaggerate that angle, make it bigger and bigger and bigger, the bending gets closer and closer and closer to the surface you're going to eventually bend this to the point where this doesn't leave. It actually stays inside, known as reflection. It bounces instead of exits. So total internal reflection means that the light will never actually pass through the boundary. It will be only reflection. And this occurs at a specific angle known as the critical angle. Anytime we're larger than the critical angle, we have total internal reflection. Anytime we have less than the critical angle, we have refraction. And remember, anytime we have refraction, we also do have reflection. All right, that's a good review for light, I do believe. I think that there's more details out there that I probably would have gone through in a full-fledged lesson. I encourage you to check those out if you are still struggling. That said, check out the free response worksheet that goes with this. Thank you.